Good morning and uh, welcome as we continue this series on the road to Calvary. Uh, we come today in the passage we've read earlier in the meeting uh, to a really important uh, milestone in the life of Jesus. Up until this point it seems that Jesus has wanted to kind of keep under wraps his popularity. People that have experienced the most amazing miracles he's told to sort of keep quiet about it. Don't go spreading the news, don't, don't tell anybody, keep it a secret. It's uh, at this point, I guess, we're about three years from where Jesus's ministry really began when he was baptised in the Jordan by John the Baptist. Well, most of that three years has been spent around the city of Capernaum, around the Sea of Galilee, about 80 miles to the north of Jerusalem. He had visited Jerusalem a number of times in that period. This was the, the sort of political and religious capital of the Jewish people. Uh, it was where the temple was, the centre of Israel's worship of the Lord God. It was a focus also of Roman power in the area. The thing was that each time Jesus had visited Jerusalem, he had got himself into trouble. He'd end up, ended up clashing with the religious elite, the leaders in the Jewish community, the priests, uh, the Pharisees. Jesus had found Jerusalem to be a dangerous place. Whenever he was there, it's like the air uh, crackled with tension and antagonism. But it seems that for Jesus there was always a strong pull towards this city. In Luke 9.51 we read this about him. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It was as if from this moment on, Jesus kind of knew that his destiny was in that city, that there was this kind of pull towards Jerusalem in his life. This, this wouldn't be a kind of straight line journey from that moment on. It wasn't as if he went, you know, straight down the, uh, uh, the A1 or whatever the equivalent was uh, to Jerusalem from that moment on. His travels continued to sort of zigzag from point to point, but there was this sense of a relentless pull towards this great city, towards his destiny. In the passage we've got to today, we've now reached the point on this road to Calvary where it seems that Jesus is on that final leg of his journey to this city, to Jerusalem. He's been travelling around the area just to the north uh, and it seems that this particular day he's made the journey from Jericho to just to the outskirts of the city. It's Sunday. Jesus will be crucified the following Friday, just in, in just five days' time. But rather than there being a kind of a mood of gloom and despondency on this day, the atmosphere amongst his followers seems to be optimistic and hopeful. At the beginning of the passage we are looking at today, it's probably uh, late afternoon. Uh, and it isn't clear if they they sort of left Jericho first thing that morning or maybe had stopped overnight along the way. Uh, but um, they've now got to uh, the, the outskirts of Jerusalem, just outside these small towns of Bethany and Bethphage, just two miles or so from the city. Jesus sends two of his followers ahead into the village to find a young colt tied up, a colt that no one has ridden yet. His disciples find the colt and bring it to Jesus. And Luke tells us at this point in verse 35, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. It was as if Jesus calling for the colt, this, this kind of young donkey effectively to be brought to him, had somehow signalled the change in the atmosphere, a change in the status of this miracle worker and teacher. There had been these occasions on the shores of Galilee at the height of his popularity when Jesus had sensed that there were moves amongst the crowd to force him to become king. We read about this in John's account of Jesus in John uh, chapter 6 verses 14 and 15. And this took place just after the feeding of the 5,000 when uh, the people were just amazed to find that he wasn't just a great teacher and a healer but he could put bread in their bellies uh, feeding a whole crowd, a multitude of people from one packed lunch. John writes, after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. 
But today, something has changed. Here on the outskirts of Jerusalem, Jesus allows himself to be placed on this never ridden before colt or, or donkey, whatever you want to call it. After all, a king could, could not ride on a, a second hand donkey that had been used by someone else. That would just not be proper. That wouldn't be fitting. Jesus allows his followers to begin to celebrate him. We read on in Luke's account in verses 36 to 38. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks along the road. As he was drawing near, already on his way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. The number of followers of Jesus had increased recently, following an amazing miracle in Bethany a week or so before. A young man called Lazarus had been raised from the dead. This had taken place during his funeral. He'd been three days in the tomb and mourners had continued to gather, uh, many of them from Jerusalem, where, where Lazarus was, was, was well known. But Jesus had turned up and he'd called for the tomb to be opened and he called Lazarus out of the tomb and out staggers Lazarus, still in his grave clothes, very much alive. And it seems likely that some of those who had witnessed this event had heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and had come out to meet the crowds singing his praise. But something quite dangerous was in the hearts and on the lips of the multitude as they rejoiced. We read what they were joyfully crying out in verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They are proclaiming him as king. Riding on a donkey nobody has ridden before. Laying their cloaks down before him for him to ride over. And some of the other gospels, the other, the other accounts, write of people taking palm branches from the trees and laying them down before Jesus. Uh, the, the thing was that palm branches were a, a kind of sign of, of um, nationalist, a sort of nationalist symbol uh, for Israel, the people of Israel at that time. Added to all of this, of course, Jesus was also of the line of David, of King David himself. He had the support of the crowds and he had the credentials to be crowned king. There was just one small matter of the fact that Israel was a nation under firm Roman rule at that time. Maybe this was the reason why the Pharisees rebuked uh, Jesus and uh, called upon him to stop the people's uh, shouting and, and calling. Um, that uh, and possibly the fact that Pharisees found Jesus really difficult, uh, the way that he seemed determined to undermine their teachings uh, and their authority as part of the religious elite in Jerusalem. Verse 39 tells us, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus' response in verse 40 was to say, I tell you, if these, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. This wasn't just a hyped up crowd of Jesus supporters. Something spiritual was happening. Something far more profound was going on. If the people hadn't been singing and dancing and cheering Jesus on, then the solid, hard stones around them would have given voice to proclaim Jesus is King. Creation itself would have sounded out his coronation. But this glorious, jubilant mood would not last. As they descended the Mount of Olives, they would have dropped into a valley before the road rose again to a ridge where suddenly they would see Jerusalem and the temple all laid out before them. And suddenly something is wrong. Something has changed in that moment as the city appears before them. His followers see a great thriving place with the temple there at its heart. But Jesus has a different vision. He sees a city that has rejected their king. Its walls torn down once again and a people in great, great distress. Jesus is weeping loudly, lamenting over what he sees. 
He is five days away from the most awful, unimaginable suffering. But he is weeping not for himself. Instead, he is overcome with compassion for a city and its people uh, as he sees events that will take place about 30 years in the future. When the Roman general Titus will muster his forces against this rebellious city for one last time and utterly destroy it. What a change. The party atmosphere is suddenly gone. Instead, Jesus, deeply moved, proclaims over the city in Luke 19, verse 42. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that made for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a bar barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. We've already seen the compassion of Jesus expressed in his teachings, his healing, his feeding of the hungry crowds, with not just with spiritual food, but with real bread and fish. But here, his compassion seems to me to be particularly poignant. Again, I find it astounding that he is just five days away from unimaginable personal suffering to pay the price for all our wrongdoing, to make possible once and for all reconciliation between humankind and the living God. But it is for not for, for himself that he feels sorrow and weeps. It is for a city that will reject him as king in the next few days and will reject the salvation his death will make possible for them. He sees with great sorrow how in years to come, they will reap the dreadful consequences of this rejection. Not only does this reveal for me the incredible courage and generosity and unselfishness of Jesus, but provides a glimpse into the heart of God in times of judgment. We see here the Son of God presented with a vision of judgment on a rebellious people who have rejected him and rejected the gift of salvation he will soon make possible through his death on the cross. But his attitude is not one of anger and rage or indignation. There's no pointing the finger, no finger wagging and I told you so, but tears of compassion. The Old Testament is full of times when God showed mercy to a wayward people, when he held back on punishment and judgment. But ultimately, tragically, as rebellion continues, judgment inevitably, finally has to come. In the tears of Jesus, we see that this gives no pleasure whatsoever to the living God. More than that, we see that in the suffering that Jesus would endure just five days later, the lengths he would go to, to rescue us from judgment, to save us. For Jesus, his compassion from this mountain of love within him for each one of us, for you and for me, demanded that he do something. And he does. He will offer himself as a sacrifice for us. He will take our place, receive our punishment for rebellion, for selfishness, for self-centeredness and sin. He will do this for Jerusalem, even though many will reject him uh, and, and, uh, and his sacrifice. He will do this for you and for me. Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem itself. In Matthew's account of Jesus entering the city, in Matthew 21, verses 10 and 11, we'll read that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. No longer talk of Jesus uh, as king, Maybe his weeping, his lamenting over Jerusalem had dampened the crowd's enthusiasm, but the city was stirred. And it seems this was the effect Jesus always had on Jerusalem. He stirred things up. 
Mark tells us how, in his account in Mark 11 and verse 11 that Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. And so it will be the following day when the final events in the passage we read earlier take place. Luke tells us in verses 45 and 46, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. We've seen the compassion of Jesus, but now we see another side of him. His willingness to directly confront hypocrisy, greed and the abuse of, of his father's house, the temple. The temple was meant to be a place of meeting with the living God. The sacrifice is personal and meaningful, holy and wonderful. But it had turned into a marketplace where human greed uh, and pu was pushing out true prayer and the worship of the living God. And then in the final verses we see Jesus has taken up residence in his father's house, the temple, where he's once again teaching the people. But not everybody is happy with this situation as we read the final verses in verses 47 and 48 of this passage. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. As we draw to a close this morning, there are three things that strike me from this story. Firstly, Jesus comes as king, always as king. It is who he is. He can come as no other. This means that uh, there is something intrinsically divisive about Jesus. Just as in Jerusalem there were those who hung on his every word and those that sought to kill him, today there are those who would receive Jesus uh, gladly, gratefully, joyfully, and receive his gift of salvation. But there are also those determined to follow their own way who will not bow to this great king. The truth is to receive his gift of salvation, we have to receive Jesus as king. Secondly, his selfless compassion amazes me. In Isaiah, in the Old Testament, he prophesies, in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verse 3, that Jesus will be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But it seems that Jesus wasn't sorrowful and grieving for himself from what he would suffer, but for the suffering and pain he saw all around him. In the sick, in the lost, the lonely, the fearful, the blind, even in those who he knew would reject him and crucify him. And the third thing that strikes me is that when Jesus comes, things change. They cannot stay the same. Light comes. Things are seen differently as they truly are. We cannot receive him as king and expect to keep living any longer to please ourselves. Rather than life being all about me, it becomes more and more all about him. Having said that, I am sometimes painfully aware that in my own life there are still pockets of resistance to his rule over my life as my king. There are areas of my life still that I sometimes find it hard to fully entrust to him, to fully give over to him. I am very much still a work in progress, but grateful that he continues that precious work. The thing is, I know from experience that when I have trusted him and entrusted myself to him and entrusted those that I love to him and those that matter to me to him, he has always proven himself to be a faithful king, a kind king, a gentle and patient king, a loving king. As we journey together on this road to Calvary, the invitation of Jesus to each one of us is, will you take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't invite us to do this because he wants us to be miserable or downhearted. He invites us to take up the cross for ourselves because it is the key to joy 
and fruitfulness. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 verse 2 that for the joy set before him, he, Jesus, endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The truth is that joy is the reward for cross carriers. To take up my cross means simply this, that whenever my way crosses his way, I choose his way. Simple and beautiful. Amen.